Welcome to the Entrepreneur Adventure, Megan. I appreciate you coming on. You have a YouTube channel called the Bootstrap Boutique, but the big thing that we're going to talk about with you today is that you do private label on Amazon. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into selling private label on Amazon? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, Todd, thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, yeah, so I do sell private label on Amazon, and I got into it a couple of years ago uh, just because I had wanted for a long time to have a little side business that was just my own. Um, I work a day job, and, and that keeps me pretty busy, but I've just always wanted something that was kind of on the side to do for fun, basically. So I had tried a couple of different things. Um, at one point, I was going to do like the whole Etsy maker thing, found out I'm actually not creative enough <laughs> to, to do anything on um, with my hands and crafts and that kind of thing. Um, and so eventually, I found my way to private label through two different sources, uh, Steve Chu of My Wife Put Her Job. Dot com, his blog, and then also Scott Bolkler's podcast, which is The Amazing Seller. So found out about this private label thing that all these guys were doing. And something about it, I was just like, I think I can do that. And so I just really dove in. I read Steve's whole blog, which he had been writing for like five or six years at that point. I read the whole thing in like three days. It was ridiculous. And then really started listening to Scott's podcast. Um, this was about the same time that uh, Jungle Scout was doing their collaborative collaborative product launch, which is the one where they started selling the famous Bumble uh, bamboo jungle sticks, the marshmallow roasting sticks. So just really followed the process they lined out to research and bring a product to market. It took me much longer than it took them. It was really about a year before I got something actually for sale on the platform for various reasons. But that is how I got started. I just decided that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go all in and really try it. And because I had tried other stuff before like Etsy and never been successful with it, um, I really took a step back and said, okay, if I'm going to be different this time, if I'm going to actually make it work, then something has to be different. Like I have to be different. And that's why I created the YouTube channel you mentioned earlier, the Bootstrap Boutique, when I started that, it was like, oh, just a little bit before I found out about selling private labels. So the first couple of videos were like, I want to start something. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know I need some accountability. And this is going to be my accountability. And then pretty quickly after that, started in with private label and just haven't looked back since. Very interesting that you had the YouTube channel before the private label. Yeah, like two or three weeks, though. It was crazy the, how the timing worked out. All right, interesting. So what was your original thought with the YouTube channel then? You just you knew you wanted to do something. I wanted to do something, and I just felt like I needed to build in some accountability to, to keep going forward. And so I told myself, okay, I'm going to do a video every week, and I'm just going to talk about like the progress I'm making on researching the business or whatever it is. And just document the process the whole way through. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we need more people like that because it's, it's really helpful to be able to share the, the knowledge that you gain and help other people. Yeah, absolutely. And it just comes back and helps you as well. Steve Chu, I've, I've heard of him and I've heard of that mm -hmm. website, mywifequitterjob.com, but I haven't really checked it out a whole lot myself. <laughs> Um, I got involved in this listening to uh, Scott Volker. So yep. Steve Chu, does he teach you directly about private label or uh, what were you learning directly from him? Steve was like my entry point. He talks more about e-commerce uh, kind of more broadly. He does sell on Amazon, but most of what he does is um, an e-commerce site that he has with his wife called Bumblebee Lennons. And so he also did kind of a documentary process of him and his wife starting this e-commerce business, um, which she wanted to do because when they had their first child, she wanted to stay home. So that's where my wife quit her job. The name came from. Mm -hmm. um, but so he talks more broadly about e-commerce. And then I, he started talking a little bit about Amazon FBA, which, you know, this was filmed by Amazon um, in, in some of his blog posts. And I think he might've mentioned Scott or did an interview with Scott, which led me over to the amazing seller, which is where I really started learning about private label. Have you uh, listened to Pat Flynn at all? 
I, I listen to Pat some. I don't listen to every single podcast he puts out, but I, I really like his um, coaching ones that he does, the Ask Pat coaching. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do listen to Pat um, whenever there's something in there that I think is going to be interesting or helpful. Yeah, yeah. I just brought him up because he's one of the original guys that helped him. Yeah, as well. it's, absolutely. It comes from all over the place, just absorb everything. So, yep. so you're doing private label now. How many products uh, do you have up and selling on Amazon? Just two, two up and selling and two in development. I mean, I'm happy to say I do about $4,000 a month when my product is in stock with that being the biggest mm -hmm. caveat. Um, I've had, that was my biggest issue in my first year was mm -hmm. just keeping product in stock. I couldn't order it fast enough and I ended up being out of stock about as much as I was in stock last year, which was pretty painful for me. So that's something I'm working on remedying this year. I've done some private label as well. I've got a few products up on Amazon, nothing that is really successful. What Scott Volker would call maybe base hits or I might call bunts. <laughs> yeah. Great, but I'm trying to build it more. So $4,000 a month and that's your, uh, your net sales. Or yeah, and that's really just with one, one product because my second product I just launched here recently. So mm -hmm. I don't even think I've been through, I haven't, I haven't even been through a full month of sales with that yet. So I don't know where that'll shake out. But just with that first product, it was about 4000 a month. Well, that's not too bad at all. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's uh, for one product and start multiplying that and you can really make a good, uh, good income off of that. Pretty. Yeah, it's just, it's just staying ahead of the cash flow of private label. That's the hard thing. Um, yeah. because it's a very cash intensive business. Yeah, that's that's one thing where where I'm really big in, in wholesale. I'm trying to move into private label more, but in wholesale we get, you know, net thirty, net sixty terms. So right. a lot of times I can sell the products before I have to pay for them. Uh, where in private label, um, you're having to come up with all the money ahead of time, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You gotta pay those manufacturers before they're gonna ship it to you. Yes. So yeah, it's definitely something to keep in mind. You have to have that cash flow. And uh, um, there's another gentleman that I listened to his podcast. I'm forgetting the name off the top of my head, but he was having the same problem where he had some really successful products and didn't have enough money to reorder because the product went really fast and it was mm -hmm. going to be like another couple of weeks before he got his disbursement from Amazon and didn't have that cash flow or had that cash flow problem. So Something yeah. really important to, to think about. Can you tell us a little bit how, uh, how you decided on the products that you went with? What led you down or led you to the products that you decided to go with? Yeah, so the first product that I'm selling, I'm still not entirely sure why, why I chose it. Um, I have been very far down the path with two or three other private label products that I ended up not bringing to market for various reasons. Um, and then I found this one and I think it was just like good enough and I was so tired and this is why it took me a year to get my first one launched. I was so tired of just kind of playing with it, you know, and, and not feeling like I was making progress. I found something, the numbers looked okay. And I was like, let's, let's do it. Right. Let's just do that one and just kind of dove in. The second product was much more of a methodical research process. So it was spending a lot of time, um, clicking around on Amazon and pulling up the Jungle Scout um, Chrome extension, looking at the numbers that they were giving us, looking at the historical data, looking at trends, um, and then looking, finally, I, I live near Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. My husband and I were out there um, in the city one night for date night, and we were walking around before our dinner reservation in all the shops, and um, there was this product was like everywhere. And I was like, okay, I think this time, <laughs> it's time to strike while the iron's hot with this because it's, um, it's not a trend like a fidget spinner, but it's more of like a home decor trend. So it's something that is popular right now, probably will be for the next few years. And then like, who knows, right? But so that made it for me a little urgency. Like, let's go ahead and take this one to market next. And so that was how I made the decision on product two. On those products, uh, the first one and the second one that you have in there, um, did you make customizations to the product or did you just buy it as is from Alibaba, AliExpress, or how are you sourcing them as well? Yep. So I'm sourcing on Alibaba. Um, the first product, I did not do a good job of um, differentiating it. I just was trying to go so fast. What I actually found is interesting is that 
because in my follow-up sequence where, you know, you go in and email the customer and ask for an email, ask for a review via email, I was specifically asking customers in your review, tell me how you use this product. Cause I just, I thought it was going to be for one thing. Turns out it was overwhelmingly for this like super niche hobby <laughs> that people have. And I was like, huh, I had no idea. So I went in and I kind of like redid my listing to really attract that customer and that type of person. And it's worked out really well. So I say with product one, I differentiated on the marketing side, not on the product creation side. Uh, with product two, I just really look to make improvements. I spent a lot of time reading um, customer reviews to see what their main complaints were. There was a couple of things that were consistent among all the top sellers. So I worked with a supplier to remedy that issue. And that's, you know, working out also. That's something that a lot of people might not think about is that you don't necessarily have to really customize the product. It's good to do that to differentiate yourself, but you can also differentiate yourself by targeting a market that nobody else mm -hmm. is doing. Um, Great. One thing that comes to mind for myself is uh, one of the items that I sell wholesale is some uh, fishing leader material it's like this mm -hmm. steel line and i'm finding a lot of people who are leaving feedback and reviews on that product actually are using it for totally other purposes like uh hobbies or crafts or there this one guy was using it to tie something behind his uh, rc race car so you could put huh. it around it was it's rather interesting there's always little things that you never think about that people might be using a product for that it wasn't originally intended for. Exactly. You can customize your Amazon page for that. You can grab that market. And it also helped with knowing um, I wanted to do a little off Amazon marketing. So I reached out to some other YouTubers because that's a platform I'm comfortable with, obviously, that were in that niche and said, hey, I have this product. Turns out people that like you love it. You know, would you be interested in me sending you something for free? And you do a tutorial on it. So, and then they would, you know, link back to Amazon using their little Amazon affiliate links and everybody was happy. So that, that's another thing. It really helps to narrow in how you want to just market it if you want to go off Amazon also. Another way that a lot of people are doing it uh, is Facebook ads. So having a landing page and running Facebook ads to get people to that landing page and selling your products directly through Facebook, basically, and not even using Amazon at all. Um, I've exactly. heard a, a story about a guy who bought a product to sell on Amazon and when he got it in the market was completely saturated and he couldn't make profit on it anymore um, but he ended up selling them using Facebook ads and making a really good business out of it that way. So yeah. something to think about too, Amazon's not the only platform. Well, it might be one of the easiest platforms to get started on um, there's tons of other ways to sell product out there as well, for sure. On the second one, you made quite a few customizations. So how did that process go with the manufacturer? What were uh, some of the hangups and the process of that? So as far as it, it was actually something that was fairly easy for the supplier to remedy. I think nobody had just asked for it before. So I kind of got lucky with that. Um, it, it really, you know, just a couple of emails back and forth. Hey, can you do this to it? And then they like, you know, kind of explain back to me in their own words to make sure they understand. And I was like, yep, that's exactly what I want. Um, and, and they were just able to do it. So it really wasn't in that example, at least, I don't know if that's like a great case study for people because it won't always be that easy. Mm -hmm. But in this, in this scenario, they were just like, yep, we can do that. And, and they did. So it was good. About how long was it from when you first contacted them to when they were able to ship the product for you? Probably about two months of back and forth. And then produ their production time was like 15 days, which to me was super fast, um, which was nice because my other product has a really long lead time. And so when they were like, you know, basically two weeks, I was like, that's great. I was very excited about that. Two months is, it sounds like a pretty good time frame. Pretty quick. Right. That was pretty quick. Sure. And so now you uh, have those products in Amazon. Did you, like, for that first product, did you just list it on there and it started selling? Or what did you have to do to get those sales moving on Amazon? 
Yeah, my first product, it was weird. Um, and I, I didn't know that I was kind of getting a little lucky, but I was. Um, because the first product, it went live on like a Wednesday and, you know, nothing happens for a few days. And then on like a Sunday night, it was that first Sunday night, I got an email from Amazon, the really fun one that, you know, Amazon has shipped an item you sold, which is always a fun email to get, um, especially the first time. You know, I think you never forget your first time. But, um, and, but I didn't even know what it meant. I was like, what? I didn't buy anything on Amazon. And then I was like, oh, they shipped. Oh, they shipped my product. And I was like, oh my gosh. You know, I woke my husband up. He was asleep on the couch. And I was like, I sold something. Um, and, and it just kind of built from there. Like my first week was like one sale and then three and then five and then eight and then 11. Um, there might've been a day or two lower in there, but you know, it was kind of like that. And I was just like, this is amazing. No, I didn't stay at like 11 sales a day, unfortunately, um, you know, the whole way through, but it was still, it, it really took off fast. And I got reviews in really quickly on that first product also, which was really exciting. The second product though, that has not been like that at all. It'll, um, with the launch, it took a couple of days to get the first sale. Then I had maybe like a day with nothing and then two and then nothing and then one and then three and then not, you know, it's just been much slower. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Kevin Sanderson, um, who also has a YouTube channel called Maximizing E-Commerce. And I was like, I'm freaking out. I don't know what's going on. This is nothing like the last product. And he's like, I've never had a product launch the way your first product did. And I said, so are you telling me to chill out? And he's like, no, yeah, I'm telling you to chill out. And it's like, okay, I'll do it. Um, the Amazon algorithm just takes a little while to start picking up your keywords to start ranking you. Um, I, I always turn P PPC pay-per-click on like right away. I don't, some people used to say, wait for reviews to come in. I don't think that advice is as effective now that you can't like offer a discount in exchange for a review. I can see how before that would have been really helpful, but now you can't do that. So I just turn pay-per-click on right away and let it run. I've done the same thing with the private label that I've got uh, turning on the PPC right away. Um, I know there's a varying opinions on there, but I, I think it, the sooner you can get that traffic going, the better. I mean, you're, you're going to lose money up front, mm -hmm. get the velocity going. As uh, Scott Volker likes to talk about, uh, if you open a brick and mortar store, you wouldn't just put up a sign, open the door, and expect people to start flowing in. You got to spend some money to uh, get the advertisement and things flowing for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, on those products, is it, uh, do you have uh, multiple versions of each product, like different colors or sizes or anything like that? Or is it just a single? item for each. Yep. For both products right now, it's just a single um, one SKU. I'm planning on for product two and three, there's going to be some variations in there of color, but it's, I haven't had to deal with that yet. <laughs> so I don't know a lot about that yet. It's pretty easy. Um, did you set your, hopefully you set your listings up already as variation listings. Oh, I haven't even, I ha we're not that far down the process yet. So okay. I haven't gotten there yet. All right. Well, I'll throw one tip to keep in mind for future products Yeah. Um, is when you create your listing originally, always set it up as a variation listing from the start, even if you're only going to have one. Because if you didn't do that, what's going to happen now is they're going to have to basically, you're going to have to work with support to create a whole new listing and then have them move your product over to that new listing. Oh, okay. Good to know. I didn't know that. For the second product, you're spending money on PPC. Mm -hmm. uh, are you profitable on that product yet? No, I'm not yet when you count in PPC, which you should. Um, so not yet because I am spending um, a little bit more on pay-per-click than I normally would once a product mm -hmm. is established. But, you know, trying like you, we talked about trying to get that velocity going and driving um, just impressions to, to the listing so people will see it so they will hopefully buy it. Um, you know, you do have to spend a little more on PPC to start. Um, but the margins on it are really good. So as soon as I can ramp those down, once, once sales have kind of steadied out to wherever they're going to fall, mm -hmm. then yeah, it will be, pro it won't take long for it to turn it back to profitable, but um, right now it's not. Now, are you using any kind of launch service or anything? Not currently. I'm talking uh, to the people at Viral Launch about using them. I just wanted a little bit better of a feel of what they do. So I haven't turned that on yet, but it's certainly something that I'm looking into. Now your products, when you're ordering them, what kind of quantity volume are you ordering? 
the lowest amount they'll let me, which is, you know, 250, 500 units somewhere, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that you're having trouble staying in stock on your product. Mm -hmm. Uh, What are you trying to do to remedy that? Well, I'm trying to, I mean, obviously I'd like to just order more at one time. The problem is, and the reason that my channel is called the Bootstrap Boutique, I knew that whatever I was going to do, I wanted to just put like X amount of dollars in and just reinvest, right? And not be continuously adding money. So then I picked a cash intensive business, of course, to to do that with. And, And I could have done it this time. I could have ordered more a product one, but I really wanted to start on my second product. So I pulled out a lot of the profit that I made on product one to invest in a different product instead of upping my order quantity on product one. So that's a, like a kind of decision you have to weigh out which one you want to do. Um, I'm, I'm not against at this point taking on some outside financing mm-hmm. to allow me to increase order quantities because clearly you know, if you don't have any inventory, you cannot have any sales, you cannot make any money. So that's been the biggest bottleneck in the business. Um, but I just haven't gotten there quite yet. One tip would be what I do is I put all of my purchases on a credit card that gives me 2% mm-hmm. cash back. Nice. Um, but then I pay the credit card off. Every yeah. Time. So you don't get any interest, but you're automatically getting basically a 2% discount on everything you buy and that can add up really quick when you start spending a lot of money for sure. What have you done as far as uh, like optimizing your listings? What do you think is the most important things you've done uh, to increase your sales of your listings? I think, I mean, certainly for product one, it was figuring out that there's a certain market of people that are buying and working, reworking, massaging the listing copy to really fit that group of people to try and speak specifically to them. And really that is at the expense of everybody else in the general market. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you have to, I think you're always going to be more uh, in demand when you're for something instead of just like for anybody. And so I, I think that's been the biggest driver for product one for sure has been really just targeting in on that one market and just trying to talk specifically to them. You mentioned earlier, you kind of, felt out that audience just by asking them through the, mm-hmm. through the emails after people bought the product, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's probably a good tip that some people might not think about because that actually gets me thinking that I should maybe ask that on some of my products too because I'm thinking they're being used for one thing. They could be used for something completely different. Right now, I'm just using those emails to uh, ask for feedback on the mm-hmm. product, but I could maybe swap out one of those emails here and there and ask what they're using the product for. Um, so I mean, that's exactly what I do. It's like, you know, please leave a review in the review. I'd love to know how you're using the product. <laughs> it's like that simple. And they, they have told me so far. Which uh, service are you using to send out those emails? Or are you doing that manually? I'm still doing it manually right now. Um, I've looked at some other, you know, some of the softwares that do it for you, but right now with Amazon, you know, they've let uh, customers opt out of getting those messages. Mm -hmm. So you might send 10 and four of them might not be delivered. And with all those services, you're still charged for those four that didn't get delivered. As far as I know, anyway, that they're all still like that. Mm -hmm. And that adds up, you know, over time too. So I just batch it. It's just part of my, twice a week routine when I sit down to have like business time. Um, that's one of the things I do. So it hasn't, you know, I'm not selling like 400 units a day or something like that. So it's, it doesn't take me that long, but I could definitely see myself hitting a tipping point where I was like, okay, this isn't worth it anymore. I'll just go pay somebody else to do it. Now, are you also asking for feedback or are you just asking for reviews? I only ask for product reviews, um, but I get a surprising amount of customer or seller feedback also. Um, so I just don't feel like I need to specifically ask for that because it's been coming in fairly regularly anyway. Okay. All right. Very good. Yeah. And, and a lot of people ask for the reviews and maybe not the feedback. I ask for both. So my first email is asking for feedback. Um, and then when they leave a feedback, that's when I ask for a review. Mm -hmm. Um, And I found with my account that as that feedback has grown, I think I have like over 800 positive feedback now. Uh, When I'm talking with 
Amazon support, they treat me completely differently than what they used to. Interesting. Um, where I can, I can get changes to listings and different things a lot easier um, than what I used to be able to do. So I think it, it's definitely a good thing to, to push that feedback um, and then get the reviews as well, of course, for the product. That, that's interesting. So you're not finding that that confuses customers because that, that's always my concern is if I ask for feedback and then I ask for a review, people are going to be like, well, I already did that and just delete your email. But you're not finding that happens? Um, I'm sure it can happen because a lot of people leave reviews in the feedback. Um, right. That's when I go and I message them and let them know that reviews are different than feedback. Could you leave this over on the item? And I have not tested it as to which way is better if I was only doing the reviews versus only doing the feedback. But I get a fair amount of reviews from asking it and uh, going that route and asking them to leave a review after they leave a the feedback. What uh, are your long-term goals when it comes to the selling on Amazon? What are, what are you trying to achieve? I'm just trying right now to have a really fun, profitable hobby. Um, I mentioned earlier, I have a day job, you know, got a young family at home and that keeps me plenty busy. I'm not really trying to quit my job and do this full time, which is a little different than a lot of people in the space. A lot of people either this is what they do full time or it's what they want to do full time. Um, so that's different. I kind of bring the perspective of somebody that's just working on this, uh, you know, an hour or two at night after, after the kid is in bed. So that I, I'm, right now my goal is to continue that, to just grow it, but at a really manageable pace um, to not get ahead of myself with that and to just keep it really fun. Uh, I was at a meetup one time in Charlotte and I was talking to a guy and I was saying something about how this is fun and, he does sell full time on Amazon and he looked at me like I was crazy. And he's like, Amazon is not fun. <laughs> I was just like, well, I want to keep it fun. So that's my goal right now. Um, I certainly want to make money with it. I'm, I don't have any plans this year or probably next year even to pull money out of the business. I just want to reinvest it and let it grow and see what can happen because I really do enjoy working on it. It really um, uses a different part of the brain for me than what I do during the day. So I just want to keep it like it is right now. I mean, I really enjoy working on it and want that to continue. Yeah, that's really important to love what you're doing. So if you love your full-time job and you're learning this and figuring it out, to be able to put all the profit back in the business is just going to help you grow faster. And you're going to be able to make those mistakes. You mentioned uh, Amazon being difficult platform to work on. Personally, I went full time in January and I've been loving every minute of it, doing it full time. There's certain parts that uh, can make you want to pull your hair out, especially working with Amazon support can be rather frustrating because you can get a hundred different answers to your questions and then right. they tell you that they can't do something when you know that they can because they've done it before and yada, yada, yada. But yeah, I think, uh, an important thing that I've done anyways when for when you do decide to go full time is you really have to you want to learn everything and figure out how to do everything but then understand what you're not good at or what you don't like doing and outsourcing it to other people like I have an assistant who does a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks on Amazon that then frees me up to focus on higher level things like finding more wholesale suppliers and things like that. So yeah, awesome. I think if you're not having fun, then you may just have to make some changes in your business so that you can have more fun. Right. Well, and nobody makes us do this, right? So, yeah. so we choose to do it. So you should enjoy it while you're working on it. A little bit uh, more about your YouTube, uh, your YouTube channel. What do you have going on over there? Yeah, well, like I said, I totally started it as an accountability thing for myself. And it's been really fun over the past couple of years to watch it grow into this larger community of people, mostly made up of um, new Amazon sellers or people that are aspiring to be Amazon sellers. And so I'm doing something right now in the month of April. It's called Data, which is blog every day in April. So typically I film or I post one video a week on Wednesdays, which is maybe like seven to 12 minute video. And then I go live on the channel once a week. But in VEDA, I'm posting a video every single day for the month of April, 
which has been a lot of fun because I had a long list of things that I really wanted to put out there, but um, none of them really warranted their own video um, on the Wednesdays. And so I just filmed them all and I'm uploading them every day. And it's just been a lot of fun um, to get all that out there and, and to get all the interaction with everybody that, you know, they're like, oh, I was looking for a way to do this one little some of these videos are very in the weeds, <laughs> very in the weeds of Seller Central and how to do stuff. And it's just been a lot of fun to work on that project here recently. Yeah, vlogging every day. That's got to take a little bit of work to come up with what you're going to talk about and, and get that content out there every day. Yeah, it's been a project. Yeah, but that's, that's cool. I need to do more posting on my YouTube channel as well and get more content out there. Like I see... Some of your latest ones here is, is it too late for Amazon FBA? What worries me about Amazon FBA? Why more is more on Amazon FBA? So uh, looks like lots of good stuff. So I guess my question would be, uh, is it too late for new people to start selling on Amazon FBA? No, I don't think so at all. I, in that video that you just mentioned, I actually, um, you know, give some facts about just the growth of Amazon and how when you think about it in the e-commerce space, it's like, okay, I don't know how much bigger they can get. But when you take a step back and you look at Amazon in the um, lens of like all retail in the U.S. at least, it's you realize that there's a ton of room for them to continue to grow. And certainly, I think the leadership team of Amazon is very interested in continuing to capture more and more ways to, to sell to people, quite frankly. So I think there's still a ton of opportunity left on the platform. And the only thing that, you know, makes it too late is, is your willingness and readiness to jump in. It's certainly not as easy as it was maybe three years ago, but it's still one of the best places to start an e-commerce business for sure. I agree 100%. And, and one of the most surprising things that you mentioned in that video is that this last year was the first time that third-party sellers like you and I sold more on Amazon than Amazon did themselves. Pretty cool, yeah. So, yeah, I really think it's still the, the wild west out there, uh, a wild frontier that uh, there's a ton of opportunity for anybody who wants to take advantage of it. Well, I think that about wraps it up here, Megan. Um, I would like to, again, recommend everybody go check out your YouTube channel, The Bootstrap Boutique. A lot of great content I've been following on there for a little while, and I love the videos. So keep up uh, doing that and keep up the great work on Amazon. I'm sure you're going to be highly successful. We're, getting, we're working on it, Todd. I appreciate your, uh, your encouragement, and thanks for having me on again today. I really, really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Have a good one. Yep. You too.